Tell them that you're going to go live. So okay, so we are going to live. We're live, live right now. Um, so Today, please, please excuse the background noise. So hello everyone. Uh, today we are here to. Okay, I'm so sorry. Is everything all right for this? Yeah, we are just sorting oh. up technical issues. Okay. I'm so sorry for that. Okay, that's okay. No problem. Sorry, about some technical issues. We will be right back with the next five minutes. Yes. Hello everyone, sorry for the delay. Um, we are all here to attend today's decolonize. Sorry for the noises. Um, so let me introduce myself. I'm Jonathan Fredos, I'm the Vice President of Welfare and Qualities at the Students' Union. Today we have our NUS president, Larissa Kennedy, and we have Shaminda Thakka from the university and Rashid Aziz as well. We have our BAA me part time student officer, Orsi, with us. We will talk more about decolonization and why it is important for us, why we should take care of it. As a person, I'm an international student, and I feel like it's really good to have someone. To see someone is in front of me as a as an ideal to follow, not to have any circumstances where I feel pressurized, not being represented or being cornered. So now I would like to pass this platform to Larissa, where she can talk more about movement. Thank you so much, Felix. I'm hoping that my sound is okay because it was cutting out a tiny bit there for me, but please give me a shout um, if anything is not okay. Thank you so much for having me um, with you at LSBU. It's so nice to be with you virtually um, and hopefully at some point um, in person. Um, but as I said, my name is Larissa, my pronouns are she, her, and I have the joint privilege of being national president at NUS. Um, and we run two core campaigns and one of them running nationally uh, across all four nations is the decolonization campaign because decolonization is not just 
important, it is necessary um, to really rectify the historical harms that our institutions have been complicit in, that our societies have been complicit in, and to move forward from that point. So I want to talk a bit more before I, I jump into to why this is so necessary. Um, I, I always find it's useful to start by kind of defining decolonization because I think often um, people come to these discussions and these thoughts with different definitions and different thoughts of the word. But one of the things that we've been trying to do as a national union and with the student movement um, is to really center what we mean when we say decolonization, um, because sometimes that word is used in different contexts. Um, and I often go back to um, a definition by Dahlia Gabriel that talks about decolonization as recognizing the roots of contemporary racism in the multiple material, political, social and cultural processes of colonialism and proceeding from that point. Um, and I, I think it's really important to take those four pillars and think about how that then is transposed onto the education system and how we practically think about the kind of material, political, social, cultural impacts of colonialism on our education system. Um, but the kind of second part to that definition, um, you know, explicitly states that this involves the laborious work of structural change at several levels of society. Um, and I dwell on this for a second because I think going back to the fact that decolonization is about structural change, it's not about kind of any uh, piecemeal approaches um, to equality, diversity and inclusion, as important as those things are. Um, it's not about the, the kind of um, deficit models um, or kind of seen to try and address racism historically within some of our institutions. Um, but what it is, is a whole scale look at the kind of structural um, problems and barriers uh, and systemic things that need to be changed in order to redress the kind of uh, ways that racism is sewn into the fabric um, of our systems. And in our case, in the education system. Um, and so principally, this is about um, how do we, as folks who are committed to anti-racism within education, um, actually analyse the ways that coloniality takes shape in the structures that we live, study and work in. Um, how do we abolish the systems of harm that have, um, you know, actually ha have, and I think we have to need to own up to the fact that they have caused historic damage. Um, but then how do we both recognise that that damage is definitely disproportionate um, to particular members of our community, but yet in the same breath recognise um, that it's everyone's responsibility to take this work on. Um, and perhaps most importantly, how do we imagine and build new futures? How do we reimagine an education system in a post-colonial future? And how do we also beyond that create a world free from harm? Um, so I think, you know, I I've been asked to kind of speak to the question of why this is so important and, and kind of some of the practical things that I've personally done in my journey around decolonization. And as I said, I think it's a necessity. And I say that because um, in my time as a, a sabbatical officer of my union, in my time as NUS president, the things that I consistently hear um, from black students, from students of colour, um, are harrowing experiences of racism on a daily basis. I often tell the story of the fact that when I was president of the Anti-Racism Society um, at my local union, I, I remember it was day four um, of the term, it was day four of the year, uh, so we had our freshers prayer ready to go um, and this was day four for first year students as I say they came up to the stall and they were telling these horrendous stories of racism that they'd experienced already by day four um, and I think that is that is something that sticks with me um, that is something that to this day I, I think back to um, because the violence that our institutions are causing when, when students are coming with so much energy and excitement um, about you know what we're told is going to be the best time of our lives um, and in fact what we're met with is violence and harm um, and consistently having to navigate that violence and harm in order to just survive these institutions in a time where we should be thriving um, is is a real um, difficult pill to swallow and so I think if we are serious about redressing that harm um, we can't just be talking about inclusivity, which is essentially um, inserting 
um, people from marginalized communities into structures that weren't built for us. We have to reckon with those structures. We have to reckon with things that are beyond our control, things that in some cases uh, were existent before the institutions we, we attend and things that, you know, feel really unsurmountable, but in fact are things that we can uh, do something about. And this has to extend beyond uh, work around the curriculum. Work around the curriculum is absolutely crucial. We have to think about the things uh, that need to be rediscovered and recovered um, in order um, to move forward from this point. Uh, we have to think about pedagogy and how uh, the way that we teach things is also reproducing systems of violence. We have to think about you know, teaching and assessment and all of those other things. That is absolutely crucial, but we have to go beyond this too. Um, and I think this is abundantly clear as we're in the run up to COP um, and, uh, you know, important conversations about climate justice and uh, how we halt the climate emergency that we hope will be happening um, in just uh, you know, less than a week's time now. Um, but what is also clear is that it's not just kind of uh, governments and it's not just ministers who we need to be looking to for solutions. We also need to look to the education system. We still have a number of institutions that are invested in, in harmful industries like fossil fuels, like um, the uh, the arms trade and such other harmful industries that are, of course, polluting the planet um, and disproportionately impacting people of colour um, in the global south. And we have to understand all of these things um, as forms of coloniality, which remain present in our institutions in the UK. I think we also need to think about um, you know, what is it that we um, could again do structurally um, to to rectify that? So even yes, if we, we've looked at divestment and given ourselves a pat on the back for doing that work, how then do we make sure that we are redistributing that resource to positively impact uh, green industries uh, and other things that are, are benefiting our communities and our society but from an anti-colonial perspective, not just decolonizing. Um, how then do we think about the impact of coloniality on our communities? Um, thinking about, you know, uh, the impact of the race pay gap on the fact that many of us um, do not see um, tutors um, uh, and teachers that look like us and uh, recognise um, the, the context that we come from as valid and um, all of these other things that, of course, pour into um, our systems of education. Um, and so how do we connect those conversations about curriculum, about community, about those material, political, social, cultural impacts of coloniality on our education system and see it as something holistic? Um, so I've just seen the screen change, so I just wanted to double check. I might be coming to the end of my time, um, but I hope that gives some reflections um, on the ways that coloniality um, kind of seeps into different parts of the university, why it is so important and in fact necessary that we act swiftly and structurally in response to some of these issues. Um, and fundamentally, uh, why this requires practice, it requires resource and it requires commitment and it requires action. Um, because we've been having these conversations for a long time. There's been, you know, the, the conversations about the, the black attainment gap evolved into the conversations about the black awarding gap conversations about why is my curriculum white? And we saw Roads Must Fall. We've seen all these different campaigns from students over years, year on year, cohort on cohort, and almost decade on decade. Um, and I think that the collective exhaustion um, of, you know, students of colour, black and brown students who are often leading this work, uh, usually with very little remuneration or recognition, um, and it's really important that we, we, we move swiftly to action um, to address that systemic harm uh, and to come up with the um, climate justice and anti-racist solutions that we need um, to win a, a different and reimagined education system. Um, so for these, I'll, I'll, I'll pause there just in case I have come to the end of my time because you know that I can talk forever on this topic. It's really close to my heart. Um, but yeah, please do, please do jump in if I'm running over time. Oh, you're on mute, I think, sorry. Thank you so much. 
And it's, uh, it's really helpful really, to be a continuous speak and continuous discussion about decolonization. And after your comment and your ex share experience, I feel like our students are going to be more proactive on sharing their thoughts and the issues with us in terms of decolonization because it's not something where one party can work and other party can sit down. It's like collective work. So the work should be going from both sides. Thank you so much um, of, and thank you for your time. Uh, now we have our two lovely people from the university team who works with me um, a lot about decolonization and they're really helpful. Uh, I would like to give this space to Shaminda right now and Shaminda will talk more about our our university's decolonization and how we have worked before, how we are working and what is our plan ahead. Shaminda. Thank you. Um, well, I'll be speaking with Rashid. He'll he'll be doing the sort of work that we've done on decolonizing the curriculum. But uh, I just want to thank you for just for inviting us to speak about this topic, and it's very close to our hearts. And thank you, Larissa, for that lovely speech. I thought it was excellent. You covered a lot of ground. I especially like the structural changes and the anti-racism aspects of it as well. I like how you connected it to COP26 and for you know the inequality inequity between the developed world and, and the developing world as as it's called at the moment so um i'm shaminda Taka. i'm a prof uh, associate professor uh, of sociology and i'm also the chair of equinet which is a network for bame staff and allies and i'm also a co-lead for the race gender and sexualities research group so my research interests are all in this but Rashid and I have been involved in two projects now. We've called it the Student Voice One and Student Voice Two. One was on the racial awarding gap. The second is on the decolonizing the curriculum. Uh, because you covered quite a lot of ground, you know, we've got some things that we want to say um, uh, in, in addition to what you just said about decolonizing the curriculum. And if anybody wants the slides afterwards, we can make the slides available as well. So Rashid, did you want to share the slides? Oh, did you want to introduce yourself? Sorry, Rashid. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Rashid. I work with Shaminda uh, on decolonising the curriculum and the uh, racial awarding gap. Uh, I'm the interim director of education and student experience for law and social sciences. Uh, my background is in the social sciences. I was a senior lecturer in criminology. Um, and I just want to say I'm having a bit of trouble sharing the slides at the moment. It's not oh, are you? OK. Um, to share them. Um, on let, me, let me see if I can share them. Sure. I don't know why it's not showing up, but it's not showing up when I try and share. Am I sharing now? Yes, you are. Yes. That's good. <laughs> That's excellent. Um, now that I can't see, I, are you sure I'm sharing them? Yeah, I okay. can see. Yeah. Sorry, uh, we just need to sort out something. Just give me a minute. Is that, can everybody see that now? I can see them. OK, OK, so we've introduced ourselves. I'm also the acting director of research, by the way. So um, I wanted to start off with um, a quote. You can choose whichever one you want from Angela Davis. She's a hero of mine. And I quite like the middle one where she said, you have to act as if it were possible to radically transform the world and you have to do it all the time. So it's something that, you know, just stayed with me. And I think with Nelson Mandela's um, quote there is education is the most powerful weapon you can use to change the world. I think those two combined together, you know, has really kind of seen me working with this particular project, the decolonizing the curriculum project. So just to move it on, um, for LSBU's decolonizing vision, uh, this was um, presented to the academic board and um, I've, I've been allowed to use it because I've been in contact with, with them as well, that the aim is to embed across the institution a decolonizing vision and that there are eight statements which have been produced and the first statement is that 
LSBU recognises the role that race, racism and racialization have played within the higher education sector and we will reject it, stand against it and be actively anti-racist. So the starting point is to decolonize the mind and move to a multi-layered dynamic process. And if you've not heard of that word before, decolonizing the mind, it's not the Franz Fanon said it, but when he wrote The Wretched of the Earth and um, Black Skin, White, Ma uh, White Mask, uh, he mentions the ways in which people have been uh, treated in the past. And he says that, you know, he quite simply will try to make himself white or to try a, a colonized person has in the past been so psychologically damaged with racial trauma that it, you try to make yourself white. That is, he will, I will be compelled, it will compel the white man to acknowledge that I am a human. So I just want you to get that one in. But And, and there is a slide to, uh, with that as well. And you can I put it right at the end so you can have a look at the YouTube as well if you wanted to. Uh, so, there's a, yeah. there's a slight issue with the slides. Uh, I think Ferdous is now sharing something on the oh. screen. Um, oh, do you want me to stop sharing? I don't know. Ferdous is. Um, Are there two things being shared? There's just one, but I think Ferdous has a copy of the slides and is sharing them. But oh, sh I'll, I'll unshare them if you wish. Shall I? Exit. Exit. Uh, so, are you there? <laughs> okay. So, oh, she stopped sharing. Yeah. <laughs> Shall I share again? Yeah. Okay. okay. It's me. I should share. So, just. I, I'm, sharing, I share I'm, it. I'm sharing it, Produce, I think. Is it showing? Yeah. So it is showing, yeah, okay. Right, we got up to the vision, decolonizing vision. Yes. Um, sorry, whoops. So we got to there about decolonizing the mind and moving to a multi-layered dynamic process. So <laughs> this is actually where the starting point of LSB's decolonizing vision is. Uh, and I must say, I, I, very, I was very pleased to read this paper because uh, um, I had a, a bit of a hand in it as well. And just to cover some of the things maybe that Larissa's mentioned already, there's uh, Professor Leon Tickley of Bristol University who says that there are three pillars of decolonizing the university and it's the university, the curriculum and research. So all three uh, are like a triad that you have to actually take into consideration when you're looking at decolonizing um, altogether, not just the university itself or the curriculum. And for um, the first slide on decolonization, I thought it would be um, good to see what we need to do um, in terms of looking at uh, decolonization, that we identify and acknowledge the roots of modern racism and colonial legacies. It's also really important to identify and acknowledge the manifestation of racism and colonial legacies in multiple forms and in the knowledge materials, the politics, the national and local institutions, social and cultural processes that Larissa was talking about as well. And of course, we need to challenge the ways in which our learning and the world is shaped by colonialism. And I, I'm reading a book at the moment by, um, um, what is his name, Satnam Sanghera, who wrote The Boy with the Top Knot, and he's called his book The em Empire Land. And he discovers so much history that I mean, history that he didn't know about and certainly I didn't know about in terms of colonialism, because colonialism is presented in a particular kind of way in a very positive light as well. So it becomes palatable for, for the colonialists, but it's not palatable for the colonized. So we look at decolonization as being multi-layered and working towards structural change. It's about widening ambitions of students. It's about transforming the organization and having some sort of commitment to change. And what we need to see is that it benefits students. So we need to embed justice and equity in the curriculum, not just as something new, but as something normative. And what it should do is to enhance the impact of our education and prepare students for career success in a global context. And hopefully there will be stronger and more relevant disciplines with a wider base of scholarship. Because often people say, I don't really know how to decolonize my subject area. 
And the other point, I'm sorry about the wordiness of these slides, but decolonization considers the institution, the staff and students, and it provides a way of identifying the knowledge that we actually value. And of course, it structured the ways in which we are taught to think and talk about the world. And the, one of the most important things is about what do we value as knowledge? What, which, which is the valuable knowledge and which one isn't? And it's usually the Western centric tradition from where it comes. And we need to challenge that assumption as well. And what decolonization should do is to form part of the practice as usual, the process of uh, curriculum review and quality assurance. So it's part of that uh, as a normal thing. And decolonizing the curriculum is really explained as where, whereby you enhance the curriculum, you include the knowledge and people from underrepresented, marginalized or excluded groups. And uh, I've listed some there as well for you to look at. So I think Larissa pointed to the history of decolonization. I mean, the debates around it, they've had resonant, resonance for universities and decolonizing the curriculum is not a new phenomenon at all. It has a historical timeline and it shows its origins in South Africa from the Rhodes Must Fall movement. It was replicated at Oxford University to, uh, towards the NUS film in 2019, Why Is My Curriculum White? So when we're thinking about decolonization, it's a review of curricula to decolonize. It's been recognized by a range of universities and it's under pressure from students and staff. So the current campaign to decolonize the curriculum is a recognition that this history needs rectification. And if you want to see the teaching of British colonial history, I'll put a, a link to BBC Bite Size um, quick YouTube thing that you can look at as well. So what are the approaches to um, decolonizing the curriculum? Well, there are many ways to approach it, and I think Larissa has been through them as well, but there are some commonalities. We can educate ourselves, staff and students about it. We can create safe spaces where we can have open discussions and then we can have support for us and to encourage co-production between staff, students and the local community. So we're looking at, you know, things like admissions, the syllabus, reading resources, placements and preparing students as well. So what we can do is to collectively decide on the measures for evaluating um, the changes made and decide on how regularly to monitor them. And I think this might be my last slide before we go on, I hope. Yeah, and we do have um, some people who unintentionally or deliberately misunderstand what decolonizing is. So um, there is a misrepresentation that if you have a decolonization uh, process that we just take white writers off from the curriculum. What decolonizing asks colleagues to consider are the viewpoints represented and the theories which are actually presented to us and represented in the curriculum. So it shouldn't be done in a tokenistic or formulaic way where we add a few um, persons of color to the author list in our module guides, but it's a process, it's multi-layered. And it doesn't mean that ju academic judgment is overruled or abandoned, um, but we, we're asking people to reflect on the content, to make it inclusive. I mean, I had some people say, well, can't we call decolonizing the curriculum inclusive um, curriculum? And I said, well, actually, no, let's call it what it is, what it's supposed to be. Uh, so decolonizing, it's not a crude imposition. Uh, and um, we, we encourage debate around it as well. It's not an easy process because some colleagues do not know how to decolonize or, or decolonizing, how decolonizing is relevant for their discipline. So I'm going to uh, ask Rashi to take over because we've done uh, some research on decolonizing the curriculum and one of the outcomes with the students and one of the outcomes was the creation of a website and we'll show you the website as well. So over to you, Rashid. Thank you. Uh, am I good to talk now? Yes. You just tell me when you to move the slide along. <laughs> to the one being live, that's fine. OK, thank you very much, Aminda. And uh, thank you, Larissa, as well. I think uh, Larissa's talk at the beginning was very, very good. There are a few things that, a um, few lines that you used that I thought were very powerful, um, especially when he talked about abolishing the system of harm. He talked about resources, uh, commitment and action. And I think that um, at LSBU, there was definitely a commitment and action 
um, on a range of these issues. Um, Shaminda and I have been involved in two projects now, and the first project really led on to the second project on decolonizing the curriculum. So uh, the first project that Shaminda and I undertook was on um, the BAME student experience, really looking at uh, the racial awarding gap. Um, at the time when we did the project, we, we were still calling it the BAME uh, attainment gap, but as Larissa referred to earlier as well, um, we move away from that kind of de deficit model um, and now it's referred to as the racial attainment gap uh, more commonly. Um, and that project explored that gap, but also asked questions about um, so asked questions about teaching and learning, also asked questions about the curriculum. And at the time, because we were doing it just as we went into the first lockdown for COVID, we asked questions about um, access to resources and things as well. Um, but just very briefly, um, part of the project was to ask students why. Well, actually, I should say that both of these projects we've we've called the student voice. Um, because we are asking students about how these issues affect them and what they think the solutions might be to these uh, issues. Um, we, we want to involve the students more in this kind of decision making and to help us better understand what that ex student experience is in relation to these things. Um, so the, the, one of the things that we ask is why students feel like there is an attainment gap. And as you can see from uh, this slide, some of the things that they said, or 51% of the respondents uh, did feel, uh, felt that students before they applied to university and the application process contributed to an attainment gap. But the two things on, or the three things really that were on here that we took into our second project was around curriculum design, curriculum delivery, and uh, the lack of BAME role models. If you can see 58% of respondents felt that that was a factor in uh, the, uh, uh, the racial awarding gap. Um, Shaminda, if you can move to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, one of the recommendations from that report then was to include the BAME student voice in designing and decolonizing the curriculum and that it should be more inclusive and provide ample opportunity to discuss issues of race and racism in a safe place. So this led on to our second project. Shaminda, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, on decolonizing the curriculum. Now we had a number of objectives. Um, when going into this project, but really we wanted to hear from the students. We wanted to give them an opportunity to voice their thoughts around their experiences of the curriculum uh, anonymously through a survey, but also let them be part of focus groups, again anonymously, um, around their, uh, the curriculum and around their experiences um, at LSBU. Um, we, we, we also wanted to create a resource site. So we, we wanted to create a resource. At the time, we weren't exactly sure what it would look like, but as Shaminda said, we have created a website on decolonizing the curriculum um, to create awareness and also to act as a resource and to kind of gather all of the information that we have into one place. Mm -hmm. Show you that website in a second. But if I just run through very briefly some of the findings of this um, project. Shaminda, next slide, please. Thank you. So, for example, the the students that responded to the survey, 86% of them uh, either strongly agreed or agreed that decolonizing the curriculum was necessary. So I think that was the first part for us. That do students actually think this is something that we should be doing? Do students care about this? So I think um, this research has indicated that that they do. Um, and but not just that they think it should happen, but also that they should be involved in the process, right? So the student voice is very important to students. Um, only 27% of students felt that the current curriculum was sufficiently diverse, equitable and inclusive. And I should state that this was um, just conducted in the School of Law and Social Sciences across all levels. So undergraduate, postgraduate, any law and social science student. Um, but 66% of students felt that decolonizing the curriculum would help narrow the racial awarding gap. So the design of the curriculum, making it, um, taking into consideration everything that we've discussed, uh, students felt that it would help to reduce that racial awarding gap. Uh, but also that 59% of respondents thought that they had a contribution to make in decolonizing the curriculum so that we should be talking to the students. Uh, next slide, please, Jaminda. 
uh, we ran some focus groups as well and some key themes uh, emerged from those um, such as what the benefits might be of decolonization, why we need to decolonize the curriculum, but also how to approach it, what the content, uh, the curriculum content and delivery should be, what the expectations were of lecturers and of students. Uh, there was also talk about privilege and how that affects the student experience. Um, and also intersectionality, so how uh, different students experience uh, the curriculum and course design differently. Um, and I just wanted to show a few quotes uh, from the focus groups just to highlight this. So around the benefits, <coughs> it was definitely felt that um, uh, decolonizing the curriculum, changing the curriculum would um, reduce the attainment gap. Um, it would also, uh, students thought that it would promote equality and promote within society uh, less of a racial bias um, <clears throat> and not just for the students but in general as well. So the next slide please. I'm not going to read through all of these quotes. I think uh, we'll probably run out of time. Um, but there were also suggestions around curriculum content and delivery. Students had a very kind of um, specific um, idea of what kinds of things they'd like to see in the curriculum. So, you know, really um, emphasizing the fact that they should be involved in the creation of our of our curriculum, of our courses. Um, next slide, please, Jaminda. Again, I'm not going to read it through everything. <laughs> okay. um, but then, then the students also made recommendations on how uh, we should do this. So students, you know, if you look at that middle quote there, I feel sometimes that students' voices aren't necessarily heard. Um, so, you know, we, we, we spend a lot of time collecting feedback from students in various forums, but students don't you know, feel like that those things are being heard or don't feel like they, they, they have enough of a voice in certain aspect. Uh, they also made suggestions about creating small societies or small groups to look into uh, things like decolonization and the racial awarding gap. Um, having panels. So, you know, we haven't written this report up, our final report up yet, but some of the recommendations for this might be around having students in um, validation meetings or having students part of validations when we create new courses or when we write module guides to take uh, students' uh, opinions into consideration. Um, and finally, from this project, I think the next slide is about the website. Um, uh, I uh, the website is live at the moment. It's decolonizing the curriculum lsbu.com. Um, it's, it's kind of going live and being taken off again at various points so that um, our uh, web designers can work on it. Um, but if you do go to the site, then you'll see various things on it. You'll see the LSBU uh, vision statement. You'll see lots of resources on there, uh, journal articles, podcasts, um, blogs. Uh, there's a reading list on there, um, case studies, webinars and events, frequently asked questions. Um, I don't know if we want to share the actual site now, Shaminda, to show everyone. Um, I don't really know. <laughs> can we do that or not? Uh, I could do that. Let me see if I can share it from my side. And while you're doing that, we have some additional slides on Franz Fanon when I talked about the colonized mind. We've got some um, books and articles which have been recently written on decolonizing and also uh, critical pedagogy by Paolo Freire. Sure. Shall I just stop sharing now? I think I have started to share now the website. OK, so hopefully everyone can see uh, the website. For those, can you see that? Can everyone see that? Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. So this is the website that's been created. It's um it's live at the moment, but um, we do take it offline now and then to to work on it. Um, so this is the home page. You'll see it's got a link to our own EDI uh, department at the university. There's uh, various case studies that we've included here, webinars and events, um, upcoming events. You can see all of our Black History Month, there, uh, month events there. We have a frequently asked questions section about decolonizing the curriculum. But at the top over here, I'm just going to take you over to resources as an example. Uh, we have reading lists um, and if you're in uh, we have featured books here. 
uh, that uh, have been recommended by various people. And if you click on these books, they take you directly to the LSBU library. So if you're an LSBU student, you can go and take one of the books out. Um, we have various other uh, resources on here as well, articles and journals, for example. Um, we have uh, just a list of them here that are useful, um, toolkits and guides. So we've just gathered things from um, all over the internet, really, and from other places and from LSBU. Um, we wanted really a central resource that somebody could, who was interested in decolonizing the curriculum or somebody who was designing a new curriculum could go to. Um, yeah, I think um, we're quite happy with this. We're, we're quite proud of it. So, and we hope that it will be a useful resource uh, for other people. And, and there is a development further on that there, there will be somebody employed as a research fellow to look after it. So it's not a static website. It will be developed continuously with the webinars and events that come and there will be a place to archive things as well. So we won't lose anything either. But we just wanted to show you what we've been doing. So that's um, from the last three months. It's taken about three months to get to this point. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Shaminda and Rashid. Thank you so much for your presentation and for your work. It's really great to see how improved our university is and how they are working forward to make sure that we are coping up with this decolonization conversation and we are not staying behind unlike other universities. So this is really great to see the resources, the reading list and the work you guys have done so far. And the comments from the student body is really inspiring and giving us more inspiration and encouragement as well to go ahead. So I feel like um, we are doing really great, um, not great, but in terms of our capability and our sector, I feel like we are still coping up with that. And as I work with Shaminda Rashid and other university people on decolonization, academic board paper and access and participation group, uh, something has been done and th that is really really good that we are categorizing our student body and we are trying our best to come for them to come and have the conversation what they think and regardless their social eco socioeconomic background their ethnicity where are they from and how is what is their course and other stuff but yes thank you so much for your time i really appreciate it and now i would like to invite or see our BAA Miss part-time students officer and Orsi are you here? Yeah. So here Orsi yes yeah, so here Orsi will share her experiences and her thoughts about decolonization with us and she's the she is our last panelist for today. Uh, yes, uh, hi everyone. I'm Oshi and um, I'm the BAME Students Officer this year. Um, I'm also a third year law student at the uni. Um, so in my experience, so this year I've been working with um, the Race Equality Charter, for example, which um, we try to get um, uh, the experiences of um, various staff members and um, students to see um, exactly what the issues are. And I think that um, the uni actually has quite a lot of good initiatives to kind of try to um, get people more involved and just get, um, so for example, um, one of the issues that were I saw mentioned in the PowerPoint as well, was that uh, a lot of students found that there weren't enough resources whilst they were applying. Um, and the university, um, has connections to different um, colleges, for example, where um, the majority of students are actually from um, BAME backgrounds, where when they come to the university, they have a lot of questions and they um, they tend to find it quite helpful. In my experience of working at Open Days and um, Taste of Days, for example, but I just think that they, um, like these initiatives tend to stop or like, it just not it's not uh, far reaching enough. So 
Um, but I think that the university is working on um, trying to um, give out more information and just I think what would be the most important thing is um, to make sure that um, the information and that the help that's available at the uni is um, reaching everyone because I think that's one of the biggest issues at the moment um, um, that even though help is available people don't tend to know about it and um, so yeah but also um, as far as um, the curriculum goes um, and the awarding app, um, the university has uh, major, uh, the majority of the students at the uni are from um, a BAME background, which makes it even more unacceptable that um, there would be an awarding gap. Um, so um, we're gonna, we've been trying and we will continue to try to um, get students experiences and um, I'd like to encourage like any attendees today as well to um, say if you have any um, feedback or any concerns to let us know and I and um, as um, Rashid said as well and I think on most courses they um, tend to send out a survey that you can send feedback so I think that's um, really helpful and you and you are being listened to, so just make sure to, if you have any concerns, come to us and um, we will try to help as best as we can. So yeah, just don't be afraid to come forward because um, everyone, I would, my kind of goal for the year is to make sure that everyone feels um, like they have a good university experience and they have, uh, and they feel represented and um, they feel like they're in a diverse environment. So, yeah, just um, let us know if you have any um, feedback at all. Thank you, Ursi. Thank you so much for sharing your experience. Um, and. I believe this is your first year as a BAMA student, part-time student officer. So you have just started your role and so many, so many times you have to face this type of conversation and you have so many time as well to work on this. So best of luck for that. Um, so we are almost coming to an end of our today's talk. Uh, in terms of, of uh, sharing any questions or concerns, if you are interested, feel free to send me an email about your concern or your questions or any of your feedback. We will pass it to the panelists and then we will get back to you. And thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for this. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for this. You're welcome.